Hey everybody, Mario Dennis with the Keeping It Real Estate podcast and today my guest, my good friend Steve Bell. Steve, how are you? I'm great, Mario. Thanks so much for having me here. Of course. Steve, you are, um, everyone I think in real estate knows you by now in the central Florida area, but you are an accountant. Yes, that's correct. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure everybody knows me, but that's kind of the goal we hope to get there at some point. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people know you. You guys have been instrumental in not only handling, but also educating um, agents and brokerages when it comes to FERP the tax um, stuff specifically. But tell me a little bit about your company, how you guys got to where the point you're at now and all that good stuff. Well, well, thanks. Um, it's really started back in 1999, if I can go back to the beginning. Um, we have a couple of partners. My firm has two partners, actually four partners, myself, my brother, Matt, and Alan and Sue Harding. Um, back in 99, if I kind of go back in that trail real quick, our UK residents initially, and they came over here to buy a vacation home, which many people do. And they decided they want to move here, so they decided to open an accounting firm and tailor to vacation home rentals and people that need FERP to really non-resident tax was really what they did. So um, fast forward about four years, uh, 2004, my brother Matt was a CPA, is a CPA, and working with another firm and decided he wanted to go out on his own, had enough of working for the man or working for someone, decided to do his own thing. And in July, started his own firm. We started talking a few months later, and I was in business and managing restaurants and retail and decided I don't really want to do this anymore. I was 39, I think, at the time, and didn't really want to be doing that when I hit my age now. So we just talked, and I started working with him, really just running mail for him and learning rudimentary you know, tax. I had a, a bachelor's degree already. So started working with him, went back to uh, school, got a degree in accounting for Weber, down in uh, Babson Park, and just started work with him doing tax returns. We were blessed. We started out of actually working out of a den in his house. It was like we crammed three computers and you know desks and so forth in there, and quite small. But we really built our business just by doing good work. You know, treating people well. Um, you know, being responsive. So we grew our business, and then in 2015 we merged with the other partners. And so Harding Bell International we kind of became a thing then. And what we did basically took our strengths and our, um, we had our really technical side and really the way we work with customers. And then the Hardings, they were very good, you know, um, with structure and growing business and dealing with people and work with their clients. And so we put our strengths together and really became kind of a powerhouse as far as what we do, really specialized in non-resident tax. But we also with that merger became, you do a lot of domestic tax work, you know, anything in the real estate industry, uh, real estate agents, uh, property managers, um, investors, foreign investors, U.S. investors. So really anything along those lines is what we work with, among other things as well. It's pretty cool. I had no idea that you had a prior life uh, prior to this. And I always like hearing stories about people that reinvent themselves and I wouldn't say late in life because 30s is not late in life, but at 39, you reinvented yourself and have this complete other life, complete other career, completely retrain yourself to do this amazingly successful business. Well, thank you. I mean, I think that, I mean, yes, I was looking back when I was very young, but even now um, I'm reinventing myself. I'm, I'm, I'm doing more today than I was doing five years ago. And how I was five years ago when we, we did our merger, I've become a, you know, a much better at what I do, much better, um, you much better knowledge. I, and I think that's a good lesson for anybody that it's never, ever, ever too late to start and to do something new. You know, you know, there's many stories out there of people in the real estate industry who start, you know, late in life, even my age and go into real estate and are very, very successful. Yeah, it, it is a great lesson because it's funny because when I was growing up, I remember as a kid, it was almost looked at like, as a downside, like if you had interest in too many areas, it was kind of like, just pick one instrument to play or just pick one sport, you know, and stick with it. And I have like a totally different mindset. I've always been like, you only have one life. Try everything, try everything out there, play different instruments, play different sports. If you don't like it, then give them up and try something else. Um, and so that's why I really enjoy listening to stories about um, someone that um, that can reinvent themselves, you know, at 39 into something super successful. That's awesome. Um, so when it comes to 
um, tax. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the FERPTA aspect, but I think a lot of the real estate agents that are going to be tuning in to listen to this podcast coming that are coming up into tax season here soon um, are interested in knowing more about um, tax consequences and benefits from whether you do um, incorporate yourself as an LLC or as a PA, or should you not do that? Or is there a threshold that an agent should get to before they incorporate and all that good stuff? Yeah. Do you want to talk on the FERPA side or like to go let's, more on the let's, incorporation? Let's go first in the individual agent side and then okay. um, whoever is still with us after that, then they can hear about the FERPA side because okay. I think it's equally important. Sure. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, you're, you mentioned a threshold, and that is something we kind of we do look at. And generally, I would say once you get to around fifty or sixty thousand dollars in gross income as a real estate agent, you really want to look hard at incorporating. Um, yes, it's going to cost you a little more m- money in tax and accounting fees, but um, the we don't recommend anybody do it at a lower amount because it's not gonna, the money you spend or you're not going to save money on. But what incorporation does at that point is that the fees and costs to do tax returns to set up a corporation will be offset by, you know, quite a bit where you're going to save quite a bit in tax. So, you know, there's a trade-off and our company is not a company that has a a cookie cutter formula for everyone. We are going to talk to the individual and say, Hey, this is what we think is best for you and your situation. And really we do that across all lines of our business. Um, Nobody has, the same situation. Everybody has different needs, desires. Um, they have different um, plans, goals. So, but yeah, definitely incorporation is important. Um, we can talk a little bit about what types of incorporation you mentioned. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I think it's an important point that you mentioned that sort of like fifty to sixty thousand dollar threshold because the interesting part is like when you're sitting inside a real estate office, oftentimes someone that doesn't know anything about taxes, but it's happens to be in front of a room, tells people, you got to incorporate. The first thing you need to do as a real estate agent is to incorporate. And maybe it isn't if you only benefit from it significantly or meaningfully after a certain threshold of income. Right, right. Yes. And there's many of us out there who who uh, say we know things about certain things. Like I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to be an expert in real estate because sure. that's not my area. But yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, it's, and definitely for the first person starting out is, is it worth it to do it? Probably not. Now, if you have the cash to do it and you think you're going to grow and make, you know, 50, 60,000 the first year, then go ahead and do it. But like I said, we'll sit down and figure out what's best, best for them. So is there any particular advantage between LLC or PA from a tax, um, from a tax advantage? Cause that's always a conversation amongst agents. Like do I do an LLC or a PA? And I think you see almost like a 50-50 across the board division and what people end up, end up picking. And I realize there is legal advantages and we're not going to talk about those, but there there's might be tax differences. Right. I mean, generally the PA, like a professional association for a realtor, um, you can set it up as like an S corporation or you can do an LLC the tax wise, it's pretty much the same thing. Gotcha. Um, there's really not a, any difference tax wise on those. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get into the leg- legalities of that because right. that's not my area. I'll right. save that for another show, probably with an attorney. But yeah, um, but generally the tax savings are, are really you're, you're pretty much the same as far as tax wise on those. I mean, you can also set up as a corp- uh, regular C corporation as well as an LLC. Or you know, for example, my brother was uh, Matt Bell. Um, CPA, uh, PA, for mm-hmm. example, and you, know, he, it's, you set up as an S corporation there. Um, someone listening to this may be wondering, um, you know, where, why is there tax advantages from, for having an LLC? Like what are some of those tax advantages? What are some things that people take advantage of um, on an LLC that they maybe wouldn't take advantage of if they were just doing their taxes as an individual. Okay, well, here's a, here's the big one, and that's really has to do with self-employment tax. If you are just receiving 1099 income as, a, as, as an individual, what happens then is you're paying self-employment tax on the whole 100% that you're getting. So you're getting hit pretty hard. You're getting um, hit with Social Security, um, you know, everything. So you're paying all of that self-employment tax. Um, once you um, incorporate, you can take a portion of that, those wages, um, and you basically take you, for example, if I have an LLC as a real estate agent, and I can then pay myself a wage, 
the um, company is going to pay for the um, uh, payroll taxes. And then I'm able to deduct those payroll taxes against my income. So it ends up saving. That's why, why it's important in corporate. It saves you money there. That's where the big chunk is. You can save $10,000 in tax mm -hmm. by, you know, corporate. So it really has to do a lot with the, the real, the, the, um, the, the, the um, self-employment self -employment tax yeah, and social security tax. Yep. Um, as far as write-offs themselves, what are some of the, th are, is there any difference between what you can write off as an individual and a corporation? Pretty much the, it's pretty much the same thing. You can pretty much as a, an individual, you can take all the same deductions, but you know, with the, um, like I said, the, the big thing is, is the payroll taxes under the incorporation and that's gotcha. where, you, and that's where the big savings are. So there's people that are just individual and they can still take the same deductions, but they're losing out quite a bit on, on, on the and, and tax it Right. Exactly. Um, what are some things that you see real estate professionals specifically, you know, besides the incorporating, um, aspect, but is there some things that you see real estate agents commonly miss as far as maybe a tax advantage and something that they're not taking advantage of? Well, I think things like, um, uh, vehicle expense and sometimes home office. And I think, you know, I may have had a conversation about vehicle expense at one time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Things like that, um, the vehicle expense, whereas you can decide to take mileage or you can take a depreciation on, on the vehicle. There's different ways to do that. Um, I think they miss some of the things like that. Um, the home office deduction, you, you can take a portion of you, for example, you, if you have an office in your home that you use pretty much exclusively for work, you can deduct a portion of that against some of your expense of the home. Now, you have to be careful with that because that's kind of a red flag with the IRS. Um, you know, you have a, you may have a den that that's all you do is pretty much have um, your real estate office in and mm -hmm. computers and you may meet clients or occasionally. But um, the, that is a red, can be a red flag with the IRS because sometimes people that people tend to um, expand on that and say, well, I have half of my house as my business where it really isn't. Sure. So sure. that can raise some red flags with the IRS. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's funny because I actually know someone that got audited for doing that very thing. They would swear they didn't. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and I actually have a story about that. We had a... Um, a my, oh, please, we love story time. Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a, a guy had a room, one room of his house, and that was all real estate, and he got audited by the IRS. So, um, agent looks around. They, they basically looked in the house to see what he had. Well, they opened the closet, and there's golf clubs in there. Well, he could basically disallow the whole thing because he had stored something that was non-business related, even though we can all say that we... Hey, golf for, yeah, for business, correct. but yeah, that was actually, you know, not allowed. So, wow. So yeah. So you got to be extra careful with that. Yes. Yeah, so you want to, you really want to only use what, you know, did a claim what you're actually using for, for business. And, and I mean, that's probably a little bit of an extreme example, but you know, it's, you want, if that, you have a room in your house, just use it for that part. part. Yeah. Yeah. And don't, don't take like half of the expenses of the house. If it's just one room, yeah. maybe it should be a, you know, exactly based on square footage, maybe 10% of the expenses yeah. of yeah, the that, house. It, or something. Yes. And exactly. That's the one thing that the IRS really is kind of a red flag when it comes to, you know, real estate agents or other types of businesses that have home type businesses. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about, um, individuals. Um, <coughs> but the other thing that that you guys have done and you've done for me in the past is the FERP that, and that gets a little more complicated. Um, but I think it's, it, it's probably, um, the least understood most important thing in a real estate transaction is when you have a FERP that seller. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, for someone listening to this that may not encounter a FERP that transaction, what that is and, and a little bit of what the process, how, how, how do you walk people through that? Sure, happy to do that. Yeah, if you're um, not familiar with what FERP is, let me kind of give you, it's, FERP is an acronym. It stands for Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act. Now, Mara, you probably know Nina Mills, who's the head of my FERP department. She knows more about FERP than probably been anybody in the state of Florida, yeah. but because we do so many. But um, what essentially FERP means is that when a non-resident sells, um, a non-U.S. resident like a foreign buyer or sell, foreign person sells, U.S. property, there's a requirement to withhold a certain percentage back for tax in case taxes due. It's not an actual tax, but just a withholding amount. So, um, and essentially the process is that when they sell the property at closing, an application goes into the IRS stating that, you know, this is what we think is the um, capital gain that's going to be due, if any, 
and then the, it, the IRS um, receives it. They take a few months to look at it, and they come back with their either agree or disagree or you know some, somewhat agree. And then the either the balance of the funds are sub- sent back to the person that sold it or a portion gets sent to the IRS or the whole amount, just depending on what the situation is. Mm-hmm. Um, even if that money is sent to the IRS, they can still claim it back. But um, back to the whole process, that, that application can be a bit complicated, and there's a lot of moving parts in it. Um, there's many companies that do FERPA. There's some really good ones, and there's some really bad ones. Um, I think one of the advantages we have is that we do – you know, over 800 uh, for that transactions a year. And according to the IRS, we've actually do more than any other, you know, company in the U S. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And that incredible. was, that came from them. So, yeah. So, you know, I mean, my team's very familiar with that. Um, they know the ins and outs and what needs to happen and, and that goes, but it, it, there's a lot of moving parts there. Yeah. So for a real estate agent, let's kind of break it down a little bit. If you are representing a seller and you go to a listing appointment, you would say one of your questions should always be, are you a legal U S resident? Um, and in the case that they say no, then would you advise at that very moment that they connect with someone in your team? Yes, yeah, so they can do that. I mean, certainly there's not much that can be done until you get a contract, but certainly if they're not a U.S. resident and they don't have tax ID numbers already or some sort, either a social security number, um, because many people have those even though they're non-U.S. residents mm-hmm. or a, t- a ITIN number, which is and individual taxpayer identification, they can contact us right away and we can kind of get the process started at least. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times this is a little bit of education. They have no idea about it or no one's told them about it. And so it's important certainly to to ask that question to get that information. Yeah, my point being like, I just had one and we were on the buyer side and it was not um, disclosed um, that it was FERP that until like a day and a half before closing when the title company finally found out about it because oops, they didn't ask ahead of time. Um, And so it always seems like, not always, but very often it seems like it's kind of like a chicken with the head cut off situation um, with FERP time. Yes, it can be. And those stories are, those happen all day, every day, unfortunately. And I think sometimes the the buyers or the sellers will hear about FERP and they're like, well, I'm just going to tell my U.S. resident, well, it's going to come out eventually. Yeah. But, and, and what happens in that case, their money's going to be sent to the IRS and it can take up to a year to get the money back. Um, so I think it's if a good real estate agent that understands at least a little bit about FERP that can advise them because it's going to make their life easier. Yeah. So the, my understanding on it is, if the seller is not proactive about this, then the entire um, withholding gets done to the IRS. And then you have to basically send them a bill for them to refund you the difference, which may be a more cumbersome um, process than you figuring out what you owe up front and just remitting the amount that you owe and keeping the rest. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And the way the, unfortunately, the way the timelines work, for example, if you sell a property now and that money gets sent into the IRS, you have to wait until 2021 to file a tax return oh, to wow. claim it back. And then the IRS has about a year till they have to release it. So you could be looking at two years almost. Yeah. So it's really important as an agent, I think, to try and educate your, your sellers and, and really to do them a, a good service by making sure they understand the process so that things like that. Don't, what happens is I get a call from a real estate agent that, hey, my money, my client's money was sent to the IRS. This happened a couple in the middle of the year. And she's like, well, I said, they're going to have to wait till January to file. And then it may take up to a year. And she's like, what? And I mean, she does a disservice. They do a disservice to their clients by not really understanding what's going on. Right. Because the flip side of that is just filing the moment the home closes. Right. You send a tax return with the owed amount. Um attached to it well, well you basically send the 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 FERP application to the, which is the 8288b to the irs um and then of course whatever funds are due back to them they'll get within a few months as opposed to waiting a year gotcha sometimes. and and the role the title company's holding here is that they can hold the money but they can only hold it for a certain amount of time before they have to send it to the irs yes very cor- that's correct yes and the, i think one of the things with the title company also their role is that they need to be um a bit proactive and find out if the sellers are non-us residents really sometimes on, on them to really check on that because ultimately if 
they handle it incorrectly, they're the ones who can get fined. And, or even the, the buyers of the property are the ones that have to hold the bag a lot of times on these. So it's important that the title company understands, you know, what's going on there. Yeah. And I think that's the part where it gets murky for people in terms of understanding the problem with this and, and why it kind of defies logic a little bit. And you kind of have to do some mental gymnastics to understand that is that it's a tax liability on the seller that the buyer is responsible for if it's not paid. Yes. And, and that's, what's kind of crazy about FERP. And I could tell a little story on that one, please. Um, we have, I have a, um, a client or a, not actually not a client gentleman called me. He got a bill for roughly $7,000 for penalties interest on uh FERP to, property that he bought um somewhere along the lines the the prior accountant the who did the FERP application or the um sellers of the property or the title company all three of them fouled up fell down on their job at some point so what happens then is he gets a bill for seven grand um from the irs even though he as the the buyer of the property had no role whatsoever in the whole process. Right. It, it's really kind of crazy because you, you as the seller or the buyer, I'm sorry, the buyer are technically responsible for FERP withholding. Yet if you're, if you don't know anything about you, you're relying on other people to handle that for you. It's a really yes. crazy and you're the one that gets fined. So, yeah, it's, I, and again, that's, I think where, you know, I've been to a few of the FERP classes and that's kind of like where everybody's eyes kind of like go behind in yeah. the back of their head because it's wait. So this is a tax on the seller for capital gains, essentially. But if they don't pay, the buyer is going to be the one that gets hurt. And it comes down to the fact that they're foreign and they don't have a social security or, or there is any right. recourse to their actions, really. Right, yeah, exactly. And when, they, when the IRS, like if, if it gets handled improperly, do they send a bill um, to the buyer of the property or do they lien the property? They send a bill to the buyer of the property. And I'm at deal, I was dealing with one, like I said, I was just dealing with one of these. I mean, and, and they come across my desk probably once a month. Mm -hmm. um, many times from other accountants. Sometimes it's account, not all, always. Sometimes it's the seller or the real estate agent. They don't handle it, but yes, they, the, and it's crazy because the buyer is the one that gets fined yeah. and, and not the seller. It's really is, Have you had any success mitigating that with the IRS or? Yes. Um, like, the, the, like, are they understanding, you know, the IRS and, and the word understanding doesn't often go together, I guess, in, at least in perception. Um, but when they see a situation like that, or is the buyer kind of just, out of luck or? Um, yes and no. Um, the buyer, if sometimes we're able to prove that it was an IRS mistake, that things were submitted correctly, they were, were, were done fine. Then we can go back to the IRS and say, sh sh we can show you, hey, we, this was submitted correctly. You know, the money was sent in, but really um, the difficulty there is it's technically, like I said, it's still technically buyer. And, and the case that I was uh, talking about, this gentleman and they really have no recourse except to try and go back to the, um, the seller. seller or the title. The title company made mistakes as well in this case. They didn't submit the money to the IRS in time. You know, they have roughly you know twenty days once they get a rejection, and whether they got a rejection or not, we don't know. But it was it was, it was a complete you know mess. Yeah, it's one of those that a, a few people dropped the ball for yeah. sure. Now, yeah, and, and now we can um, call and ask on some things, and we do <coughs> occasionally. We'll call and we can get some things, you know, taken care of. Uh, Nina with the, my team is phenomenal with that, and we have a, pretty much have a direct line to the FERPTA department. We can can discuss those kind mm -hmm. of things. So, yeah, anyone listening to this, they need to understand. Like, if you have a FERPTA client, they need to be calling you guys for sure. Yeah, um, it, it's. It's just such a different experience. I've been on the on a few different transactions on the buyer side where it's handled by someone else, and it's just a totally different experience. Yeah, what we we have a really good team, and that's what I think one of the things we do pride our firm on is that we have you know very good professionalism, and and you know, we're very responsive. I mean, nobody's perfect; we all make mistakes, but generally, my team is pretty responsive, and and I think that's really contributed to our growth as well. Um, you know, we. Um, we have good people that are responsive and we understand, you know, business. We're not, and um, many, there's many accounting firms that are very good and you have very, a uh, lot of really bright CPAs and accountants out there, but many times they don't have real world experience. They don't understand business and how business is done or they're not people person and they don't understand that you need to communicate. And so it's, I, those are the complaints a lot of times I've heard from people. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that it's interesting about you guys. I can't think of any other um, 
um, CPA firm or accounting firm that, that spends so much time and effort with real estate agents and real estate professionals and you guys attend the events and you guys sponsor things and you guys are like constantly helping the community. I can't think of any other. Did you guys do that by design? Like that was something that you guys decided to do by design or you kind of fell into it? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that our DNA has always been working with investors. So hence, um, you know, real estate agents and property managers. So we built those relationships o over the years and, and then, and, and we realized that, Hey, we want to continue our, our growth is important. And in order to continue to grow, we need to have to be in the community. I know some of it's just organic. Like I said, it's organic. And that's really how we grew. In fact, we really never have done much advertising. And was, I think it was more in the last few years we started getting out a little bit more, just connect more um, because people wanted to have us come out to do classes. And it really started with that. You know, we were asked uh, our team to come out. Hey, let's can you come and do a, a FERPA seminar at our office? So we started, you know, going out doing those things. And then it kind of just became a little bit more, hey, can you come sponsor this? So a, a bit organic and a bit, you know, by design as well. We do try and target the real estate industry just because we know it. And we know the property management and investment industry. So that's a bit of our wheelhouse. Um, so you guys are open to that? You guys teach classes and stuff like that? Is, is that something you guys still doing? Yes, absolutely. We can do anything from, well, of course, we do quite a bit of FERPTA classes. Um, we will do um, seminars on basically kind of thing we've talked about today about working with real estate agents. Um, in fact, we hold seminars in our office once a month at least um, on different topics from, you know, estate planning to um, we will have one on you know tax for real estate professionals. Um, we'll do we'll bring in financial planner in um, you know International Day where we're doing you know we're doing non-resident tax FERPTA you know um, money um, you know, um, as as well as your know, home warranties and, and you know, money transfers that kind of thing. So but we'll, we'll do all kinds of different types of classes in the office. Plus we're available to go out anytime to other places as well. Yeah, that's one thing that I think it's really cool with you is like anytime that I've needed something, you're always like one message away. I can get in touch with you. I can get a, an answer to a quick question or, you know, and and that's important because oftentimes I think what happens with um, people in your profession and your line of work is that that's not really the case. They kind of there's like all this uh, walls between them and the world. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's a little bit um, kind of the way the accounting profession has been traditionally. And I, but our firm has never really been the traditional accounting firm. In fact, we used to, you know, work, I said, work out of the office wearing shorts and t-shirts because we weren't meeting people. But, yeah. you know, of course I don't do that now, but cause I'm, I'm meeting, you know, people constantly. But um, I think that that makes us, makes us stand out a bit more because we know that, um, people are busy and they need answers right away. So, and we're going to do our best to, you know, get to them as quickly as we can. And I, I think that's, you know, that and building relationships, people want to um, work with people they know and trust, you know, you can't just go out and meet somebody and expect them to come and give you business. It just sure. it doesn't work that way. I think people want to know that you have skin in the game, that you're invested in, in their success and invested in the air, the community and that you're going to make them look good as well. They want to make sure you're you're real, that you're not just a fly by night. Yeah, it's that's the thing that real estate is really turning into. It's a very much of a relational um, business <clears throat> between um, real estate agents, between partners, between vendors. It's just, um, I think it was much more transactional um, for many years, but it's definitely turning more to the relationship side now. Yeah, I think so too. And I'm not sure why it's necessarily doing that. I mean, you would think with technology, it would be maybe a bit the opposite, but it's mm -hmm. almost become more, you know, relational and, you know, that people want to work with people they know and, and they, and, and, and like hang around and, and do, and you want to, and of course you want to trust the people you work with. That's the way I am. I will, I like if people need a property management a company or an agent, I will, Really, um, I'll refer the people that I know and trust that are going to do a good job for them because my name's on the line. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the reasons that's changed, I think um, everyone, generally speaking, consumers are more sophisticated. And so if you have to decide between two or three professionals that are all really good at their job, you're going to pick the one that you have something in common with or that you, know, that you can relate with in some level. And I think that's where the... Uh, relationship part comes into place is that I think sort of like the bar has been raised to us to a point where people not only are 
picking based on this category of competency, but now they're picking competency and maybe something in common or or chemistry or whatever else you want to call it. And I think um, a lot of times that's how we're doing business nowadays is uh, picking people that we get along with. Yeah, I, w- I would definitely agree with that. I mean, we'll have, um, I'll have clients uh, come to me because their prior account just doesn't respond or they're nasty. And and like I said, there are some great accountants on, and we will refer people back and forth to some others depending on what their needs are. Um, but then there's some really bad ones too. And so I think you you definitely raise a great point that, you know, you everything can be pretty much the same on the same level. But if you like the person, you know, I'm going to go to the person I like as opposed to the person that I don't like if everything's, you know, the if same. All, th- all other yeah. things being equal. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. the rational. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's... It's, it's, it's a cool thing. And I think, you know, that's one of the things about social media that I think has been really good is that social media allows you to peek into people's sort of like into their window a little bit, even if it's not real, even if people are just trying to be something that they're not or whatever the case may be, you can tell if you, I can pretty much tell you from my Facebook feed who I can have a beer with and have a good time and who I would have a beer with and dread the time <laughs> that I spend with them. You know, it's it's not that difficult to figure it out. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and my it's funny because my coach asked me, um, I have a coach that I come to help me with my personal development. And he asked me not long ago, I said, what, what are some things that made you guys successful? Because we, um, we went from having 30 you know, clients to our firm now with our merge firm, we have thousands, you over, I'm not sure what the number is. So Mm -hmm. he asked me how, why were you guys successful? Now we weren't that big when we merged with the other, but we were fairly big. So he asked me, what were the reasons? Well, one was, I think we're likable people. You know, we're just, we were raised, you know, to be, treat people nice and equally. Um, I think the second thing is we try to do a good job, but we're not always perfect. We make mistakes, but we're also humble enough to say, Hey, we messed up, but we'll, we'll fix it. Um, third thing would be that we are competent. We, you know, we're going to respond. We're going to, um, you know, find a way to make it, get it done. And I think last, I was kind of thinking about this last night that, um, one of the things I think that's a strength for us is that we are a real world, you know, accounting firm. We're not just eggheads, you know, knowing tax law. We actually run a business as well. And, you know, I come from a business background where I had to understand P&Ls and had to hire staff and fire staff and, and run a successful business. So I've, I've been there, done that. So we understand, I think a little bit more the real world for people as opposed to, you know, Hey, you know, yeah, someone that, someone that has a sort of like a pop-up, um, tax shop during tax season type situation. (laughs) Right, right. That nine months out of the year, they're doing one thing. And then three months out of the year, they're a tax specialist. That's not, that's not what you guys are doing. No, no, exactly. And that's one of my kind of joke about that. You have people that they will go wash windows, you know, nine months a year and then nothing against window washers. Okay. We're all going to grind. I'll do what I have to. But um, if you just have a W2, the guy that's just doing those kind of tax, that's fine. But if you have anything beyond a W2, you really need to find a good, you know, tax professional somewhere else. Yeah, it's it's very cringe worthy when I see some of my colleagues going to some of the pop up shops for their taxes, or their friend who's a tax accountant, or downloaded some software. I'm like, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> like maybe, maybe you know, I always say like maybe doctors, lawyer, and tax professionals are not where you want to cut corners. You know, you can try cutting corners in other things in your life. Maybe a mechanic, you can try to cut corners. I mean, the worst case scenario is you'd be stranded, but um, doctor, lawyer, and tax professionals, you just try to get the best you can afford. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and, and quite honestly, I'll have people come to us and say, well, listen, I have a W-2, I'm a mechanic, I have a W-2. I'll tell them, we may not be the best fit for you, and I hear some other people that can help you. I know we'll help them if they really mm-hmm. want us to. But generally, it's a bit, we're a bit overkill for our firm and what we do. We're more working with professional um, the person that has, you know, is in a growth situation, you know, yeah, someone whose taxes are not this big, but maybe they're this big, right? Exactly. Cause we're going to be able to help them more so, you know, than, than, than the other guy. And so it's in that case, but definitely we, there's, there's a time and a place or there's, there's a place for everybody. So tell me a little bit about, um, you mentioned you have a coach. How did you come about getting a coach and, um, and, where did you find one and how, how's that worked out for you? Okay. Well, let me, that's going to open, let me open myself up a bit on that. Let's go. Um, yep. And I'll we're be, only 34 I, minutes in. <laughs> I'll be, I'm going to be a little transparent here on this yeah, one. Go for um, it. We had, had, um, had uh, merged with my other firm and it was, to be honest, it was, it was a completely different world. 
um, you know, we were used to working, you know, in a small office. It was very family oriented. Um, in fact, my, you know, we had family where my sister and my ex-wife and other people, we, it was a real family small. We had eight to 10 employees mm-hmm. when we merged. So, um, and then going into the new um, company merger, you know, I had a new role. Um, essentially, my role was business development, doing what I do. Um, and I, w- frankly, got to the point where I was struggling, struggling a bit. And mm-hmm. I was struggling to, you know, um, with my role a bit. And, and I got stuck to the point where I, I had to have a kind of a come to Jesus moment. And, and I said, I'm, I need help. I can't do this on my own. So I um, had actually um, had heard a guy at my church. He came and did um, a, a seminar on personal growth. And he was an ex-pastor. And he, was, he started it. Guys, a gentleman's name is Duke Mac Locke. He's an ex-pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, and consider me great guy. And I reached out to him and say, Hey, listen, I need some help. You can you help me? So we started chatting and he kind of, what happened is I was, and to be honest, I was, have always been successful in what I've done, been blessed. Um, not necessarily anything. And you know, I was, had a, a decent work ethic, but I had some things I need to work on. Um, self-discipline was a huge one. And you know, having a routine. Is and, that what you're running now? Uh, well, I I'm running because I kind of got lazy, <laughs> <laughs> and I need to lose some weight. I want to be around for another fifty years. So good. Yeah. So, um, anyways, I got with him, and he put me on a morning routine, and said, "Hey, you need to have a morning routine. You need to have a a time where you reflect, where you read, where you um, you know, you, you work on your mental, your spiritual, your um, your growth, and your physical um, you know, health." So. I, I, with him, I started putting in, in a, a morning routine and we worked on that and it just w- really, um, it made a huge difference for me, huge difference. I mean, I became, I started, I've done things, um, by doing that, it just, it just, it, I think it boosted my confidence personally. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew I could do things, but I think it really helped boost my confidence. Um, I'm not the same person I was five years ago. Um, I have done things, um, in the last couple of years that I never expected I would do. Mm-hmm. And so, um, through that, just having someone kind of look at you from the outside and challenge you and say, Hey, th- you need, you're falling down in this area or, Hey, you're doing great in this. I mean, cause he's done that for me on both, on both ends. say, listen, you, you don't know your potential. You, he's looked at me and said, you know, you don't even, you don't understand what you can actually do with your life. And what an interesting thing, the whole potential thing is, yeah, isn't it? It is. And, you know, I said, and we, what we talked about before is I don't think you're ever too um, old to um, grow and to become better. Cause I believe that my next 50 years are going to be better than my first 50 by far. Yeah. You know, I, and, and I think that that can be for anyone in any, in any business or any kind of place in, in the life you can do that. But um, having that coach certainly was a great, has been a great benefit to me. Um, really helped me um, center myself a bit and to kind of just uh, continue to grow and to find areas that I need to work on, to focus on those. And um, it's just been an amazing experience with him. That's good. You know, one of the things is I'm, I'm very critical of, of coaches and self-development and um, rah-rahs and big stadiums. And I'm just super critical yep. of it because I've been through um, through those programs and I kind of see what happens to people in them. Um, and, you know, it's rare. I I do not believe, I don't not believe in coaching. I just believe it's very rare to find good, meaningful, relevant coaching because most of it isn't. And it's an industry that's not very regulated or at all regulated or policed. And so like anyone can claim to be a coach and an expert and, um, and just kind of take someone's money and not really do anything in, in return for them. So it's good to see um, them actually make a difference with you. And I really like what you said about he didn't just concentrate in this one thing like you were struggling in business because of your new role as a business developer but he didn't just look at that he was like hey you know you are a whole person you're not a business developer so we got to work on the whole spectrum right right and, and I, I agree with you i'm not a huge on the big rah-rah thing and that comes yeah. from a guy who grew up in church where i've been to revivals and yeah and different things like that where you get a lot of rah-rah and it's just a lot of emotion because and sometimes it, i think it's good to kept, get an emotional boost but yeah i mean and i think but that's what it is right yeah. like the thing with the rah-rah it's now that it doesn't work and i i feel like sometimes i'm 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 misunderstood about it i I don't think that it doesn't work. I just think it works for a short period of time. Like, 
you know, I remember the first time that I went to a Tony Robbins event, in, you know, 2006, I think it was, we're talking 14 years ago, you know, yeah, did I feel different when I came out of that place? Yeah, I was ready to like take the world, you know, like, but it goes away. And so then, you know, and that's kind of, they get you because then they'll sell you the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing. And then you find yourself um, hooked to having to do these things constantly to keep yourself motivated, you know, like the number one predictor of to figure out who will buy a self-help book is someone that's bought one before. Mm. So like the book, book publishers, when they're doing marketing, that's how they figure out how to target an audience. And so the number one predictor for self-help is people that have bought a self-help book in the past. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and so that's kind of my, my point on that. But I, I'd like to hear that someone like takes a full approach because I'm a big proponent that, you know, what you, that your mind is like the rest of your body. You know, it's whatever you feed it is what it's going to become. So... Um, so you need to feed it some good things so that it can process properly, just like your body and, and you need to be working on all those things because they're, they don't live in a vacuum. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think that's one of the, um, one of the, the big takeaways I've had with working with my coach is that, um, he wants me, wanted me to work on my spiritual development by reading, to work on my, you know, my business growth by reading, um, by listening to, you know, podcasts, if even just a short amount of time. And, and working, you know, physically as well, it's, they're, they're all part of their, they're, they're, like I said, they're not in a vacuum. You need to work on all those aspects of life really to be able to grow and be the best version of yourself. Um, and I think if you have, if you, you know, if you, whoever your coach is, if you have tangible things to do, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of as long as you do something and you do it consistently, you're probably going to grow. You don't have to have 10 different things through your life and change, but if you, if you are consistent, find something and just keep grinding at it. And it's going to work. It's going to work. You just have to be consistent. Yeah. The physical aspect is the one that's always kind of left in the rear view mirror. And I, quite frankly, when I see uh, someone that calls themselves a personal coach and they're completely out of shape or out of tune with their physical health, I'm like, how are we going to talk about discipline here? Like yeah. your body's the vessel that carries you. That's, that's your meat vehicle. That's yeah. taking you from point A to point B and you're not taking care of it. Yeah. Like, do you change the oil in your car? Because I do. I want to make sure that it takes me from point A to point B. Like, you got to, discipline goes across everything. And the physical aspect is important because there's chemicals, you know, there's endorphins, there's things, serotonin that gets produced when you're, you know, doing exercise and when you're kind of pushing yourself, uh, you know. I always tell people because, you know, I noticed that you've been running because I'm a runner, you right. know, and I spend a lot of time out there. And, you know, I always tell people, like, there's there's a point on every run that there's no thoughts like there's it's me and whatever podcast or whatever i'm listening to in the at the time but there's no other thoughts and like that's that's so good for my mental health because it's really sometimes i go to sleep and i'm dreaming about work obviously that's not good so i need to be able to disconnect somehow and physical exercise can do that sometimes yeah it is and and being quite honest i mean i, I had been I think we talked about online or on Facebook, I used to run, you know, five miles a day, you know, mm -hmm. um, three times a week. And maybe that's not me be a lot for some people, but for me, that was good. You know, yeah. I've gotten down to a pretty good, you know, physical, you know, level. And I kind of got off of it a bit. And then I'm ba really back on it because it is important because people, how people uh, view you and they see you, if they see, okay, I see this, you know, 500 pound accountant, how disciplined is he in the other areas of life, you yeah. know? And it really is important. It really, and I don't know that we ever used to look at it that way, but certainly I think today, you know, you, the whole man is important. You know, you well, yeah. I mean, it's funny cause I'm, you know, one of the things for me is that I, it's important to me that, that I'm in better shape than anyone I ever knew. And the, what I mean by that is, you know, I'm getting close to 40. When I was a kid, there was no 40 year olds that looked like me. Right. And so, you know, that's important. And I think that's a good thing because there's a lot more people that are active and that take care of themselves. But I, you know, I think that's something that you got to keep going. You can't throw in the towel when you're 50 or 60 or, and say, you know what, you know, it's a wrap, you know, like you got to keep at it and you got to keep, you know, like you said, keep, keep on that grind for sure. Yeah. It's a life. It's a, it's a life thing. It's not just a short term. And you know, I have, I have kids that are still in high school. So, you know, in middle school, so I want to, uh, be around for a long time for them so you know my my goal is to stay healthy and stay fit so that i can be with them and like i said i i'm hoping to have another 50 years because you know who knows what you can do in 50 years so. well that's good you know and it's funny um if someone's listening to this uh, still 
um, and it's piqued by the conversation. There's a there's a doctor. His name is David Sinclair. Okay. And David Sinclair, he is, um, he's a doctor, and he is the head of um, some of the DNA and anti aging laboratories in Harvard University. And he just recently published a book, but his, his whole approach to aging is he treats it like a disease. He says everything else that you get diagnosed with that it's going to kill you eventually is a disease. But, and we know aging is exactly that, but we don't treat it like one. And so, um, so he talks a lot about um, things that you can do to kind of keep yourself not just alive, but, you know, living you know, not alive and, you know, in a, in a couch doing nothing, but like alive and vibrant. And, um, and I think that's important. And I, I hope the future is more of that for sure. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think we're seeing that, you know, quite a bit. I'm not sure I'm ready to go down the vegan path yet, but we'll certainly, I'm certainly working well, on it. According to David Sinclair, that's not the right path. <laughs> well, good. That's good to hear. <laughs> I'm just a moron, but he's a Harvard guy. So I'm going with him. I will do that. I'll stay, <laughs> I'll stay with that one. <laughs> Hey, Steve, it's a pleasure talking to you. I hope we can do this again. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, can you tell people how to get a hold of you and your website and all that good stuff, please? Sure. Thank you, Mario. It's definitely a pleasure being here. Um, our website is www.hbitax.com, and you can reach me at 863-968-1010. Or, and just throw out my email address real quick is steve.bell at hbitax.com. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks.